To be honest, I'm most anxious about this microphone because I went to a conference and spoke, and when I saw the video, the headset was sticking out of the top of my head like that, and it looked perfectly absurd. So I'm hoping that you've done it. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, um, identity and nothingness in Python and Django. But before I say uh, anything else, I want to say thank you for, for being here. At DjangoCon Europe is really a wonderful thing, and I'm very happy to be part of it once again. And thanks to everyone who's been a part of the team that has put this together. Uh, the discussions about this DjangoCon started in Heidelberg last year at the last DjangoCon, where I met Benjamin and Emil, and we first talked about the possibility of a Danish DjangoCon Europe. So what, you're, what you've been enjoying this week is the result of a year's work. And so please, a special thank you to Benjamin and Emil and all the team, and we're very grateful for everything that you've, you've done. That's me, that's my favorite photo. Um, you can get in contact with me by email. I sometimes bother to look at Twitter, but honestly, it's possibly the worst imaginable way of, that human beings have found to communicate with each other, so I don't use it very much. Um, I am a Django core developer. I, I should point out that I am the an ex-vice president of the Django Software Foundation. I'm not doing that anymore. It's, I did it for three years, it was very enjoyable, but I'm afraid it's no longer my responsibility. I should mention that because so many people have talked to me about it today. I work for Divio. Uh, many of you know Divio. We are sponsoring the conference. We're sponsoring the speech to text, um, as we've done for, for several years, um, which is a really nice part of, of this event. Thank you, uh, Cheryl and Julia back there for all your typing. <laughs> um, and um, at Divio, what we do is we, we have a cloud platform for Python and Django hosting. So the idea is that you're an application developer, and that's what you like doing. And so you give your applications to us to run so that you don't have to worry about them. So it's like you sleep while we drive. So, <laughs> And I'm doing a, um, a workshop tomorrow. It should have been on Wednesday, but for personal reasons, I couldn't be here in time. Uh, but I never wanted to do DevOps, uh, which is for application developers who are interested in exploring um, cloud deployment, things like Docker and containerization and uh, questions of maybe code portability that haven't occurred. Uh, before. That will be on Saturday at 12 o'clock. So it'll be quite an introductory thing, but it's hands-on. I, I can hear a bit of noise as I move around, so I'm sorry if this noise from the microphone is disturbing you, but uh, I don't suppose there's anything we can do about that. Oh, and the other thing that's really important to me is my involvement in the African Python communities and their events. Um, at this DjangoCon, we've got attendees from Namibia, Uganda, Kenya, uh, Nigeria, Ghana. Maybe there are others, but I didn't meet them. But I've never met so many African attendees before at uh, a DjangoCon. So take this opportunity to speak to them, find out about Python and Django in their countries, and perhaps visit one of those events too. So wild horses wouldn't prevent me from going to uh, the first African PyCon, so please take a look at that. Right, that was my what? I'm so sorry about this noise. I, I'm not sure what it's banging against. My, my skull. <laughs> uh, I, I think the banging's coming from me, but I'm not sure what we can do. So, Anyway, this is a 16th century fresco. Um, in the Apostolic Palace in the Vatican. And it depicts um, mainly uh, thinkers and schol uh, scholars and thinkers, uh, mainly from antiquity. It's by uh, Raphael. Um, and if we zoom into the center, uh, here at the center are, uh, by the way, also at the center of attention, as you can see, they are Plato and Aristotle. Aristotle, who was uh, Plato's most famous pupil, and like all good pupils, felt obliged not just to learn from his teacher, but to respond to him too. And we have Plato 
pointing towards the heavens in reference to a world outside space and time, one belonging uh, to the pure forms that the things in our material world are just kinds of shadowy copies of. And Aristotle is answering him, and he's pointing down to the material world because he argues that form only exists as the form of substance and that um, knowledge and truth require us to generalize from the concrete and the particular, so we abstract from the particular. Um, and these two directions of thought um, represent the, most, the single most important axis in Western philosophy. Which do we reach for or turn to first? To universal truths and ideals that lie beyond the world of the senses? Or to the actual world that presents, it to, it presents itself to us at our feet? Now, you can't imagine that you can reduce uh, Plato and Aristotle to such a, a simple dichotomy. It's much more uh, subtle and, and complex than that. But still, this difference represents two different directions of thought. And you don't need to be a student of philosophy to, to recognize them. And people generally recognize themselves. Some of you will, will, will do this. You'll have intellectual sympathies already right now that generally resonate with Plato's. And some will find themselves more by inclination inclined to the, um, uh, to the Aristotelian. This doesn't mean that people are um, Platonists or Aristotelians or that they do or don't believe in a world of universal pure forms, but that generally speaking, they find themselves inclined to prefer a certain direction or way of thinking. And you can use the axis represented by these two different directions as a key to understanding the history of Western philosophy over the last 25 centuries. And um, we're going to um, come back to this. So when I started learning Python, which was 10 years ago this month, I had a very memorable experience. It was a five-day introduction to Python and Django, and we were given a handbook. And uh, as you can see, I lived in that handbook for years afterwards. It was literally always open on my desk beside me, and every page looked like that, because that became the place where I put down my coffee cup. And I took it home one evening in that very first week, and I showed it to my girlfriend, Carol. And she leafed through it, and then she exclaimed, functions, classes, and attributes, it's Aristotle. And in his ethics, Aristotle is concerned with virtue. He argues that the defining human function is rational activity. And he's very interested in the relationship between what a being is and what a being does. And I mentioned this to the person who was giving us our training the next day. Uh, his name was Ian Millington, whom some of you may actually know. And it turned out that as well as having a, earned a doctorate in the field of artificial intelligence, uh, his first degree was in theology, and so he was familiar with these ideas. We had three of my colleagues in the room with us, and Ian and I were animatedly discussing Aristotle and reason and Python and functions and the human soul. And after enduring a few minutes of this, one of my colleagues announced, I'm a creationist, and this talk about functions and reason is making me feel very uncomfortable, which I wasn't expecting him to say. So, I was completely puzzled and not entirely sure whether he was teasing me with a joke or if I'd misheard, and I asked him, um, what about it made him feel uneasy? And my colleague Ben said, you needn't look so surprised, I'm a creationist too. Uh, at this point, my mouth was hanging open a bit, and I don't think I looked very intelligent. And then my third colleague said, Daniela, you're outnumbered, I'm also a creationist. So I was a little bit stunned, and there were so many things I wanted to ask, like, should we accept Aristotle's account of virtue as a disposition? Or what do you make of Aristotle's conception of function as defining activity rather than purpose? Or do you identify a contradiction between Aristotle's form-substance dualism and a creationist account of the soul? So all these things were going around in my head in quick succession, but the only one that formulated itself into anything resembling an actual coherent sentence was, what about the dinosaurs? <laughs> and fortunately, fortunately, I didn't actually blurt that out. And if there's one thing I've learned in life, it's to recognize when I'm outnumbered. So, I, as intrigued as I was, 
I didn't pursue the question, but I've never forgotten that experience, and I marveled at how quickly we got from basic concepts in programming to ideas in metaphysics and, and ontology that weren't only important to uh, academic philosophers, for example, but could also resonate with people who had not studied philosophy or theology, and those ideas had the power to shake uh, people. And shaking people is exactly what important philosophical concept, concepts tend to do. Philosophical concepts are literally at work. Uh, they're literally expressed in program, programming itself. We find them expressed in code, and we work with them when we think and talk about our code. And this has become more obvious the more I see of it, how deeply embedded in programming these ideas are. Yes, obviously, logic is a branch of philosophy, and programming is putting together sequences of logical operations. But as the experience with Aristotle and functions suggests, Maybe it's deeper and more interesting than that. Now, for a programming beginner like me, um, this connection gave me something quite useful to hold on to, a way into understanding pro programming concepts through things I was already familiar with. I already knew my way around things like attributes and ontologies and identity and truth and nothingness and so on around um, types and instances and abstract classes, uh, not because I knew what they were necessarily, because these things are contested and troublesome in philosophy, whereas in programming, at least, somebody's gone to the trouble of defining them very strictly for you. But they were things that I was used to tangling with. I was on familiar territory. And another thing I really enjoyed uh, were the declarations about programming, which seemed often very mysterious and poetic. My handbook said, Functions are first-class values. It said, values have type, variables don't. And it reminded me of Wittgenstein. Truth functions can be arranged in series. Or Kant, existence is not a predicate. I really couldn't judge whether these declarations were true or what their implications were. And I wasn't sure what kind of things they were. Were they axioms or necessary truths or discoveries? But I could tell that they seemed to be significant, significant declarations about something important. And reading statements like these about Python reminded me of the feeling I had when I was first studying philosophy and encountering things like this in philosophy. I couldn't judge necessarily whether these statements were true or false, but they seemed really strongly to lie upon a line of truth. It seemed to matter whether they were going to turn out to be true or not. And they were often things that I didn't understand the first time or the 20th time I, I read them, but I felt that they demanded that I come back to them again and again until I did. And the same with the things like that that I read about Python. And when you find an idea that seems to lie upon a line of truth, you feel an obligation to follow it and explore it and find out um, more about it for yourself. Sometimes these statements had the benefit of making me feel superior. Python, my handbook said, correctly distinguishes between an initializer and a constructor. Many languages, like Java, conflate the two, incorrectly calling this a constructor. Now, you can only imagine the pity and scorn I felt for those who might conflate a constructor with an, in an initializer. And I had literally no idea what a constructor might be, but I knew that I would never be so gauche as to confuse it with an initializer. <laughs> um, and in just the same way, I enjoyed a kind of superior feeling in philosophy sometimes. Here's Kant um, criticizing the resort to philosophical arguments that appeal to common sense as a, defiant, uh, a convenient way of being defiant without any insight. So uh, I will take any opportunity to feel a bit superior, even if it's on the basis of no more merit than having chosen a good side to be on. Now, when I started my programming, I kept running into surprises that were not unlike the problems that philosophers find themselves with when they start to do things with apparently simple concepts. For example, even a child learns to use the word nothing with confidence very early on. Go, what are you doing? Nothing. <laughs> and we use the word and concept a dozen times a day, not just in speech, but in the thinking that represents and orders the world around us. And we do it without, without hesitation or doubt. And just as in philosophy, nothing starts to look more troublesome when we peer at it more closely, the programmer who has to deal with nothing runs into similar complications. One of the first things I learned to do was how to check for nothingness as a programmer. 
And all of a sudden, it was a marvel how many different kinds of nothingness there were, how many different kinds of absences of something could exist. There was none, and there was zero, and there were empty lists and sets and other collections. There was the empty string, and then in Django model fields, I discovered further kinds of nothing. There was null for the database and blank for the forms, and they were all not something, and they were all different. And in the Django applications I started building, I needed to represent the world to construct a picture, not just of its material, but of its logical form. So let's say I needed to be able to represent actual people. Well, yes, I'd need a person model for that. Um, so we have actual persons in the world, and I'd need to have an adequate account of actual persons in my own logical representation, in my thinking, that is, in my Django models, in the database, in the forms, in the output. And all the different kinds of nothingness didn't merely make a difference, they made a different kind of difference to it in all of these different uh, representations. So you can just think about the names and parts of names that people have. Which ones of those can be non-existent, or will you allow to be non-existent? And, uh, non-existent? How, how do you code it? What nothingness, what combinations of nothingness will you allow? How will n- these nothingnesses that you allow affect the way you display them, or order them, and so on? It turns out to be really complex, because nothingness isn't a simple business, and it affects everything it touches. Nothing really does matter. <laughs> And I found another abiding fascination on the other side of nothingness and negation in being. So just as negation has its origin in nothingness, so identity has its origin in being. Uh, Both identity and uh, being belong to the verb to be. And once again, even a child learns very early on how to use simple words like is confidently and correctly. And so does the Python beginner, usually using these notions in simple, successful ways. So the new programmer will have read or been told that is refers to identity, while um, is equal to the double equals sign um, refers to equality. But just as in ordinary language, we can say 7 and 7 is 14, or 7 plus 7, um, sorry, I got that wrong. We can say 7 and 7 is 14, or 7 plus 7 equals 14. Um, There isn't too much pressing need to worry about it at first, because they all seem to work in expected ways, like this, until they don't. Because here, although A and B evaluate to the same thing, they are not the same object. And the Python beginner will continue to run into puzzles in which their expectations built on apparently similar outcomes of apparently similar operations are confounded. The two operations are only apparently similar. You might say superficially similar, but I think actually the similarity is at the deepest conceptual level that only a human being would recognize. And that's why human beings get into so much trouble when they're programming, because of their ability to handle deep concepts. And the puzzles can catch them out in their code. Um, Maybe you know what's going on here. So we have a a sum, and and here we have another sum, and okay, A is turns out not to be B, but it's equal to it. So, and that's very puzzling until you understand what's happening. And the Python beginner will start to explore, to find out what the hell is going on here. They will learn more about is, what is is, and what equality is, and what assignment, assignment is. And it'll be quite a while before they internalize all these rules and ideas and learn to ask the right kinds of questions. And here it's um, because of an implementation in Python where um, numbers up to 256 are handled differently from larger ones. So once again, these are ideas that we use in everyday life without hesitation and get away with it, while philosophy has spilt a vast amount of ink trying to understand these things. And it might seem like an awful lot of trouble for such a small word like is. And people lose patience when people make a lot of fuss about small things. They think it might be the same kind of quibbling that's going on that Bill Clinton famously indulged in when he said, before the grand jury, it depends on what the meaning of the word is, is. And that wasn't a good look, and it's also not a good look to be squirming and sweaty on television when you're being interviewed about your relations with a young intern who was less than half your age. But the Python interpreter has more patience than a grand jury, and (laughs) importantly, uh, it has no powers of understanding. So when we're dealing with it, we'd better be sure 
that we agree with it on what the meaning of the word is is whenever we use it. And we'd better understand Python's internal metaphysics of being. So I want to return again to the question of Plato and Aristotle. Carol was delighted to read about functions and attributes in Python because it reminded her of Aristotle, and indeed, he certainly has a lot to say about them. But since we've been contrasting Plato with Aristotle, let's look more closely. For Plato, our attention should be directed towards the ideal forms of things, because the actual things in our worlds of senses are merely shadows or imperfect copies. Um, for Aristotle, Aristotle, on the other hand, we have to start with the concrete particulars and abstract or generalize generalized from them. Form is found only in hearing and substances. And to me, this actually aligns quite nicely with another distinction. The object-oriented programming we do in Python is class-based. And excuse me if uh, this is old news to you, but class-based programming is not the only object-oriented paradigm. Prototype-based programming, as used in JavaScript, is another. So in class-based programming, we define abstract classes, and from those classes, we instantiate objects. In prototype-based prototype programming, we create concrete objects, so we start with the concrete and use those to create new ones. I say we, I've never done this myself, actually. But it's funny, isn't it, that in Plato and class-based programming, we start with the ideal form the idea of the object, the blueprint, the class that defines it, that exists in and of itself. Whereas in prototype-based programming, the general form of a thing only exists through the concrete. In other words, it seems to me that Plato, not Aristotle, is a better model for Python. So um, Plato is to Python as Aristotle is to JavaScript, perhaps. <laughs> Carol didn't know that, but she's a philosopher, not a programmer. And here we are back again. Um, with Plato pointing upwards for the source, to the source of truth, the realm of ideas and the abstract, and Aristotle referring to the concrete world around him at his feet. And to say that one is right and one is wrong is not the point. But I feel that it's a difference that somehow asks us to take sides. For example, any debate now between a pragmatist and an idealist can be overlaid upon the encounter between Plato pointing up and Aristotle pointing down. Not to say that idealists are Platonists, or um, pragmatists are Aristotelian, or that their positions are dependent on those of Plato or Aristotle, just that we can see, say that we see how these two uh, approaches, these different approaches align or fit. So Plato and Aristotle lived 25, century, 25 centuries ago, but their ideas are still alive and at work, and we can engage with them, and I love that. So let's go back to this question for the last uh, time, which is the one for us, which speaks to us most deeply. And I personally have two answers for this, and sometimes I think this, I don't have to choose, is really the best answer. But the other times I think the answer is Plato, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> Maybe there's a better way to look at this. Here for the last time are Plato and Aristotle on the walls of the Apostolic Palace, all eyes on them, the center around which everything else revolves, pointing up and pointing down. And here's John Travolta in Saturday Night Fever, all eyes on him, the center around which everything else revolves, also pointing up and pointing down at the same time. And those two directions give us a line. It's a line of truth. We can choose a direction on that line. We don't have to, but we can. And the important thing is not to choose the direction, but to be aware of the dimension it gives us. John Travolta gives us both directions at once. And as I mentioned before, when you find something that seems to be a line of truth, you feel obliged to follow it and explore it, to work it out for yourself which direction is yours. And this is the force of the demand I felt in philosophy, to respond to those kinds of things. And of all the people in the world that I've met, the ones who respond to these questions most strongly are programmers. Maybe the people who become programmers are predisposed to being alive to these questions. Maybe programming itself seeds something in people. And it's not just the way that they're alive to these questions, it's also the way that programmers seem to be especially well-equipped to tackle them. I've never met any other population of people, including actual academic philosophers, who can think 
and talk about philosophical questions as intelligently and wisely as programmers can. And it's an experience I've had over and over again. There is something in programming that gives people insights into certain kinds of philosophical questions and a clear grasp of certain important concepts. Logical ones, yes, you'd expect that, but also those around ontology and the metaphysics of existence, around identity and nothingness. And the conversations I've had with programmers about these things have been consistently more enjoyable and rewarding than the ones I've had with my students, for example, or my colleagues, or as we call them in academia, opponents. <laughs> And I'm sure that if programmers became philosophers, they'd have something to say that would be worth hearing. So here's Kant's treatment of the concept of nothingness. It's uh, equal in technical rigor to anything you'd find in, uh, that a programmer could give you. And I'd love to see a philosopher programmer get their teeth into that. Or into his um, uh, analysis of judgment, which he describes as logical functions of unity. There's that word, functions again. And I'm pretty sure that a programmer philosopher would have something to say more valuable about it than the reams of worthless rubbish that I've had to read on the subject of Kant's table of judgments. And I'm not, I'm not talking, by the way, about essays by my undergraduates, but actual books I've taken the trouble to buy. <laughs> and there are so many places to go and things to think about that are directly related to these concepts in uh, programming. There's so much that we could continue talking about, and maybe it's um, much wider and further than you imagine. I love this stuff, and programmers are made for it, and I find it nothing less than fascinating. And I'm not really sure what to conclude, because I can't give any advice about this. Um, programmers are made for this, they seem to be generally good at, good at it. All I can say really is, um, thank you for the conversations, and I hope that there are going to be many more of them. Thank you. Do we have time for a few questions? Oh, yes, please. Yeah. Hmm. Can I keep the slides up, please? Just in case I need to go backwards and forwards. Yeah, do we have time for any questions? Yeah. We, do have que we do have time for questions, if there are any. Okay, <laughs> I'm stunned. Russell is out of words. Can we please mark that in a calendar? Like, Thank you. Hello. So um, you gave basically two examples of links between philosophers and um, programming languages. Um, can you uh, give any more examples? Like, for example, some programming languages actually embody different concepts of what it means to be a program, like uh, uh, logical programming or um, or, or data flow programming. Th these are basically different, different definitions of the program. And um, can you give any example of, of philosophical concepts that would be exemplified by this sort of thing? And I know that it's like a, a tackle kind of question. <laughs> like yeah, the I mean, uh, the honest answer is yes. I um, sorry. Could, could I have the slides up? That, that I might want to flip something back. Um, I probably could, but now that you've asked me in front of everybody, I, I'm not sure if I, I can. I, I know that, for example, that um, I read that the, when the Russians were developing their own programming archetypes and paradigms, that they had computers that ran on... <laughs> um, um, they, they had computers that ran on uh, not binary systems, but they had three values in there at the, at the very lowest level. I'd be very fascinated to um, uh, know a little bit more about that and what it says about our understanding of logic and truth, for example, because our understanding of logic and truth is directly connected to our understanding of um, binary. So that's a kind of lame answer, but as soon as I've left the stage, I'll think of a really good one. <laughs> oh, sorry. Thank you. Daniel, it's always a huge pleasure to learn from you. From you. Thank you for allowing us for that. And uh, this philosophical point of view, uh, quite of slightly provocative question, if you allow me. In Python environment, what would be the place for the allegory of the cave of Plato? <laughs> oh, okay. Well, the, the Plato's allegory of the cave is, I think, quite interesting because 
um, if I can try and explain this in a moment, he, he, he argues that what we see through our, our senses is it's just a kind of shadow of reality. We don't see the true reality, which is only attainable through the understanding and, and, and through reasoning, not through the senses, which are a kind of second-rate way of grasping the world. So uh, his thought, his analogy is of that, imagine that we are sitting in a cave and all we can see are shadowy representations on the wall. And they're shadows that are being cast by things that are outside the cave in the light. So they're only poor copies. So, you know, uh, uh, if we draw a triangle, if we have a triangle, we'll have a, a triangle somewhere. It'll have three sides, but it's not a perfect triangle because of course it's made of material stuff and even at the atomic level, it'll be a little bit wiggly. But it's a triangle because it derives somehow from the ideal class of the triangle that exists purely as a thing in itself beyond space and time. And, you know, you can't overlay these things completely, so the analogy starts to break down because every single object that I instantiate from my Python class is perfectly good, unlike the shadowy, imperfect copies that our material reality is. So I don't think you can press this analogy further than it goes without starting to find out where it breaks down. But that's also the point at which you um, are already deep enough that it's going to be hard to get out. And, and that's why you should, the point which you should actually start reading Plato for himself and, and will get something uh, out of that. So it's a starting point to say the th kind of things that I've said, but it's, you know, don't take that as an authority on Plato or Aristotle, please. <laughs> Hi. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much for the talk. Um, I wanted to know what you thought about if programmers can define functions and define meanings, does that make programmers gods? Oh. <laughs> um, in the interest of time, I removed a very large section on, on, you know, on, on being god. And actually, that is very much the experience that I had when I started this programming in Python, building objects and build, constructing worlds and constructing the logic of the worlds and the things in the world. And I think, you know, I, I felt some sympathy for God after a while, here, having to make it all Yeah, well, in consistent. the beginning was the word, right? That's what that book says, so. so exactly, no wonder he had to go and lie down after a, a few days of it, because, yeah, <laughs> it, it's, it's, World building is a really fascinating thing, and that's what we're doing with constructing objects in this kind of programming. So, yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you also for the talk. Um, I'm not quite sure if I got everything right, and maybe being a little bit too serious about your talk, but um, like after that talk, you could think that like uh, programmers. Uh, Compared to philosophers are like the elite of the society, like creating so many things and defining things and knowing so much about things. But um, yeah, so like, what do you think about that? And like, or maybe phrase this differently. Uh, actually, philosophers do not really have control of society, right? So they have a lot of crazy ideas about society and about like defining everything quite into serious few categories, but in the end this doesn't really end up or add up with what happens in reality. Yeah. So do you also see some relation there as yes, well? Yes, I, I do actually. And it, it, um, this morning's talk on arsenic was also connected to this because programmers, we are, you said, asked about being playing God and in the world of the, our Python environment, yes we are. But some of the programmers that are around are actually building tools that frame the way billions of people think. Billions of people use Facebook, and their conception of friendship and relationships and so on are mediated through what has been given to them, in effect, by Mark Zuckerberg, which is a pretty frightening um, thought. So he is providing the template for the way of thinking that literally billions of people have because it is, um, 
used so much by them and is so become so deeply embedded in their thinking. And, and that's, quite, um, that's quite sinister when it comes out of this safe little environment, Python environment, into the real world. Um, Plato, I talked about philosopher programmers, which was an allusion to Plato's idea of philosopher kings. He said, you know, there will never be a just society until um, kings become philosophers uh, or philosophers become kings. Well. Actually, that history has not really borne out that idea. And I think it would be lovely if programmers became philosophers, but I don't think it would be a great idea if programmers became kings. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Unfortunately, we are pretty much out of time. Yeah. Thank, you um, Thank you very much.